on World News Tonight. Tremors in the ocean. Magnitude 7.4 earthquake strikes in Indonesia and tsunami warnings issued to several areas. Terrorism rampant. Explosion at Pakistani counter-terrorism ammunition store kills over a dozen people. China backing down? China's foreign ministry has stated that it respects the sovereignty of former Soviet nations. What does this mean to Russo-Sino relations? Find out tonight. Bolshoi spectacle. The world's greatest opera and ballet companies prepares themselves to leave for China. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you're watching World News Tonight. Now we lead with tremors in the Indian Ocean. A magnitude 7.3 earthquake struck west of Indonesia, Sumatra Island. Indonesia's geophysics agency said triggering a tsunami warning for around two hours. The tsunami warning asking authorities to immediately instruct residents of the affected area to move away from shores has since been lifted. The European Mediterranean Seismological Center earlier pegged the quake at 6.9 magnitude. The quake at a depth of 84 kilometers hit at about 3 a.m. Western Indonesian time. A number of aftershocks were detected later and one registered 5 magnitude. Indonesia's Disaster Mitigation Agency said that the authorities were collecting data from the islands nearest the epicenter of the western shore of Sumatra. The Padang, the capital of West Sumatra, the quake was felt strongly and some people moved away from the beaches. News footage showed that some Padang residents evacuated by motorbike and foot to higher ground. Some carried backpacks while others huddled together under an umbrella against the rain. Indonesia suffers frequent earthquakes because it straddles the so-called Pacific Ring of Fire, a seismically active zone where different plates of the Earth's crust meet. Indonesia suffers frequent earthquakes because it straddles the so-called Pacific Ring of Fire, a seismically active zone where different plates of the Earth's crust. Two explosions have rocked a counter-terrorism facility in northwest Pakistan, killing at least 12 people and injuring more than 50 others. Shangfullah Khan, a police official in Kabul, stated that at least 12 people died in the blast and the counter-terrorism department in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province's Swat Valley, while more than 50 were reported injured. He added that he doesn't believe that the blasts were caused by terrorism and explosions occurred after explosive material in the CTB building's basement caught fire. The building complex also houses the Kabul district police station and headquarters of a reserve police force. But the main damage was done at the counter-terrorism department building. Provincial police thief Akhtar Hayat said that he was an old ammunition store in the office and police were probing whether that caused the explosions or if it was an attack. The attacks on the large police bases have been linked to the Pakistani Taliban known as Tariq A. Taliban, Pakistan or the TTP since the start of the year. Most of those killed were police counterterrorism officers, adding that the women and children who were passing by the building were also killed. Bilal Faizi, spokesperson for Khyber Pakhtunkhwa's Provincial Rescue Service, said that the research for more wounded was still in its initial stages. The regional hospital administration said that it received several wounded people, some of them in critical condition. China's foreign ministry is saying that it respects the sovereignty of former Soviet countries such as Ukraine, an apparent effort to distance itself from comments by Beijing's wolf warrior ambassador to Paris that's triggered an uproar in Europe. China's government is apparently distancing itself from the comments made by its hawkish ambassador to Paris last week, which sparked outrage in Europe and appeared to question the sovereignty of countries that used to be members of the Soviet Union such as Ukraine. Comments that also threatened China's efforts to be seen as a neutral party to the war. This was China's foreign ministry spokeswoman Mao Ning on Monday, who told reporters that Beijing respects former Soviet countries as sovereign states, that common sense dictates Ukraine is sovereign because it's a member of the United Nations, and to underline it, said her statement represents the official position of the Chinese government. The embassy in Paris is saying the ambassador was giving only his personal view.
The ambassador, Lou Chaillé, had told French television in an interview that former Soviet countries, quote, don't have actual status in international law when he was asked whether Crimea was part of Ukraine. Ambassador Liu is no stranger to controversy. He's what's called a wolf warrior diplomat in China, known for their hawkish and abrasive style. He's been summoned by the French government several times. The upcoming Yun Biden summit will see a critical outcome on the security front. While the United States has been bowing to use all means to deter a North Korean attack on South Korea, there will be a statement where Washington will reassure and enhance its extended deterrence commitments to Seoul. On Wednesday, President Biden and President Yoon will announce major deliverables on extended deterrence, on cyber cooperation, on climate mitigation, on foreign assistance, on investment, and on strengthening our people-to-people -people ties. That was U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan speaking to reporters in Washington, D.C. on Monday. And when asked about the details of the deterrence statement, the White House official refrained from giving too many details. What I will say is that we believe that that statement will send a very clear and demonstrable signal of the United States' credibility when it comes to its extended deterrence commitments to the Republic of Korea and to the people of Korea. Sullivan's comment has prompted questions by watchers on what this future commitment to extended deterrence could mean. How different would it be, if at all? During the second meeting of the two leaders back in November, President Yoon said there's a need to effectively and drastically strengthen extended deterrence between South Korea and the U.S. in line with North Korea's advanced nuclear capabilities. Yoon's remarks may have given us a hint of what Wednesday's statement might be. Although the full extent of the deals won't be known until the announcement is made, multiple South Korean media agencies quoted a diplomatic source on Tuesday who said the two countries are in the final stages of drafting a document that would allow retaliation with U.S. nuclear weapons if North Korea launches such an attack on South Korea. Some reports are calling it a Korean-style nuclear sharing pact, with South Korea able to negotiate with the U.S. on the operation of American nuclear weapons if deemed necessary. The deal would be different from NATO's nuclear sharing agreement, as U.S. nuclear weapons would not be deployed in South Korea. All eyes are now on Wednesday's statement and what changes it may bring to deter Pyongyang's nuclear and missile threats. Now, seated next to Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres criticized Russia's invasion of Ukraine for causing devastation in the country and fueling global economic desolation caused by the COVID pandemic. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov chaired a meeting of the United Nations Security Council on Monday, which meant the representative of a country accused of violating the UN Charter and brutally invading its neighbor was given a platform to warn that the values of the world body were under threat. As during the Cold War, we have reached the dangerous, possibly even more dangerous, threshold. Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council, which has a rotating monthly presidency. Before Lavrov's remarks, Secretary General Antonio Guterres stated plainly that Moscow's invasion ran contrary to the United Nations mission. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, in violation of the United Nations Charter and international law, is causing massive suffering and devastation to the country and its people, and adding to the global economic dislocation triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. And the U.S. envoy, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, went further. Our hypocritical convener today, Russia, invaded its neighbor, Ukraine, and struck at the heart of the U.N. Charter. Thomas Greenfield also accused Russia of violating international law by wrongfully detaining Americans, calling for the release of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich and ex-Marine Paul Whelan. Whelan's sister, Elizabeth, was in the chamber on Monday. And I want Minister Lavrov to look into her eyes and see her suffering. I want you to see what it's like to miss your brother for four years. I'm calling on you right now to release Paul Whelan, Evan Gershkovich, immediately, to let Paul and Evan come home, and to cease this barbaric practice once and for all. 
Before the meeting, Elizabeth Whelan accused Russia of arbitrarily detaining Americans as bargaining chips with the U.S. This is not the work of a mature and responsible nation. It is the action of a terrorist state. In addition to the U.S., a string of Security Council members, including France and Britain, condemned Russia for its war on Ukraine. But Moscow was not without allies in the room. China, which has a no-limits partnership with Russia, welcomed Lavrov as chair of the meeting and sided with Russia in condemning Western sanctions. Unilateral sanctions that violate international law must be resisted. The United Nations is working to save an agreement that allows the safe export of Ukraine's grain from black seaports that could expire on May 18th. We're going into a short commercial break. More news on the other side. Welcome back. Sudan on the brink of a civil war is seeing its capital city of Khartoum quickly become a ghost town. Sudan's battling generals have agreed to a three-day ceasefire, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said. After 10 days of urban combat killed hundreds, wounded and wounded thousands and sparked a mass exodus of foreigners. A sigh of relief for these evacuees as they set foot on the Spanish tarmac after being airlifted to safety from Sudan. The EU foreign policy chief says most EU citizens have left Sudanese soil. Some foreign governments are opting to get their citizens to nearby countries. South Korean nationals touched down in the Saudi capital, while France evacuated almost 500 people, including citizens from 36 countries, on flights to Djibouti. But not all operations are going smoothly. Some 2,000 British nationals remain in Sudan awaiting wider evacuations after embassy staff were given a priority lift out of Khartoum. The UK government says it's working around the clock to explore all routes. We continue to advise all British nationals in Sudan to stay indoors wherever possible. We are now asking British nationals to exercise their own judgment about their circumstances, including whether to relocate, but they do so at their own risk. Other foreign governments continue the race to evacuate citizens by road, air and sea. Those unable to leave remain sheltered in their homes amid shortages of water, food and medicine. As continued fighting raises fears that Sudan could plunge deeper into chaos. Troubled regional bank First Republic has stated that its deposits fell 40.8 percent to $104.5 billion in the first quarter, which saw the collapse of two other mid-sized banks and sparked fear from customers about widespread bank failures. Customers pulled more than $100 billion of deposits from First Republic in the first quarter, the U.S.-based lender revealed on Monday. The news sent the bank's shares plummeting by as much as 20% in after-hours trading in New York. It comes just a day after Credit Suisse revealed it had seen $68 billion of asset outflows. First Republic says it now plans to slash spending by cutting executive pay, paring back office space and laying off up to 25% of its employees in the second quarter. First Republic came into intense focus after Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank collapsed last month, shaking the confidence in the U.S. regional banks, with video showing people lining up outside the First Republic Bank in California to withdraw their funds. Fears the bank was also headed for failure last month prompted a group of major U.S. banks, including J.P. Morgan and Citigroup, to inject $30 billion into its balance sheet. First Republic said on Monday withdrawals had stabilised this month. Dozens of people, including women and children, have been killed in rampant violence amongst rival gangs in Haiti. And UN officials say that the security situation there was hit an alarming level. According to the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, at least 70 people have been killed and 40 more wounded in clashes between rival gangs in Haiti between April 14th and 19th. The gang violence is centered in Cité Soleil, the largest slum in the capital Port-au-Prince. According to a statement released by OCHA, the humanitarian and security situation in many areas in Cité Soleil has now reached an alarming level. 
It stressed that women and children are especially exposed to the ongoing gang violence, with reports saying that 18 women and two children are among the dead. The violence has limited the movement in and out of Cité Soleil, while also cutting off access to essential goods and services. It's also led to the closure of many schools and health centers in the area. The region is also facing severe food insecurity and is among the worst affected by cholera in the country. At the same time, torrential rains in recent weeks have worsened health and living conditions for those living in the shantytown. Haitians who are sick and tired of the gang violence that has crippled the capital are now taking action. Police say a mob beat and burned 13 suspected gang members to death with gasoline-soaked tires in Port-au-Prince on Monday. Witnesses say the mob took the suspected gangsters away from police and beat them and stoned them before burning them to death. Port-au-Prince has seen criminal gangs take control of what's been estimated as more than 60 percent of the city since the assassination of President Jovenel Moise in July 2021. In the overseas territory of Mayotte, French authorities have begun a controversial operation to expel thousands of migrants from a shantytown there. France says that it plans to send the migrants to a Comoran island, to Anjon, but Comoran authorities say that they will refuse to take them in. France is also planning on destroying more slums across Mayotte, with residents there fearing they could end up homeless. Thousands of kilometers away from mainland France on the overseas territory of Mayotte, a controversial operation to expel illegal migrants is underway. Almost 2,000 police officers have been brought in to beef up security forces on the island. France says it aims to expel at least 10,000 people. It says they'll be taken to Anjouan, one of the islands that makes up the Comoros, some 70 kilometers away. But Comoros insists it has no plans to take back the migrants. The French government estimates that up to half of Mayotte's population of 350,000 don't have French nationality. It's the poorest territory in the EU, with overstretched infrastructure and explosive levels of crime. Many of the island's residents support the operation, saying the insecurity has made it impossible for them to lead normal lives. Authorities also plan on evacuating and demolishing several slums thought to house illegal migrants, but some residents say they haven't been offered any alternative accommodation. France insists that it's offered to resettle every family whose homes are slated for demolition. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Guatemalan president pledged his support for the Republic of Taiwan on a state visit that comes as China steps up pressure on the handful of countries that still maintain formal ties with the island. Peruvian archaeologists have discovered a mummy believed to be over a thousand years old with some of its skin and hair still intact. The mummy was found at an archaeological complex of Cajamaquila near Lima's outskirts. The body is believed to be that of an adolescent. Hundreds marched through the streets of Brazil's capital demanding land demarcation under the slogan Indigenous Future is Today. Without demarcation, there is no democracy. Chile has buried some one million poultry and an avian influenza that has gripped farms and put pressure on egg prices. An upswing in egg prices has also been observed globally. New Delhi residents listed poverty and accessibility to health care as their top concerns after the United Nations said that India's population is expected to match China's by the end of April and surpass it as the world's most populous country. Coca-Cola topped Wall Street estimates for the first quarter revenue and profit, benefiting from resilient demand for its sodas as well as multiple price increases undertaken to combat higher commodity and shipping costs. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with the Bolshoi Theatre, which is home to two of the world's greatest opera and ballet companies preparing themselves to leave for China. Stay safe and have a good night.